Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Harry Sherrod, and on behalf of the Talks team, very warm welcome to the latest in our uh, Talks series. Uh, just a couple of preliminaries. Uh, I quite often forget to say this, so remember this evening, uh, would you put phones on silent or switch off? A couple of phones have gone off in Talks recently, so it'd be good if we uh, avoided that. Thank you very much. Lots of people reaching for their pockets. Um, hopefully lots of you are members. Um, if you're not members, you can join this evening. Our colleagues down at the back, and if you are members, obviously lots of uh, memorabilia there. So um, you've obviously had a little taster there of uh, the, uh, the professional video, so can you please give a very warm welcome to Vicky Butler-Henderson. Thank you very much indeed. Honestly, it's really quite overwhelming for everyone to be here for me, so I'm, I'm really grateful, so thank you very much. No, well, thanks. It's great, uh, great to have you here, uh, Vicky. So um, let's, let's get started. So let, let's go back two generations, in fact, because your grandfather actually raced here at, at Brooklands. Yes, he and, did. Uh, we, don't, yeah. I think, uh, we don't have a, a photograph of the car actually at Brooklands, but which, which of those cars is it then? So my grandfather is the one on number 85, so he's the one in the middle. Uh -huh. so, so, and this, this him here? Yeah. Um, no, the next this, this one, one here? Yeah, Sorry, yeah this one. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he was Lionel Butler Henderson, and he was my dad's father. And he kind of started the whole petrol in our veins stuff. Um, and he raced in the 30s, and this was him as part of a, a, a three-man team that they raced in many Alpine races, and, uh, and here in Brooklands as well, which is lovely. Yeah, um, I blame him for everything. <laughs> Yep, so, so another picture of the car. Again, not, not at Brooklands, but part of a, some sort of a, a trial, an alpine trial, I think, yeah. you've taken part yeah. in. And uh, one of our members did a little bit of research, and in the very comprehensive book about Brooklands, we think there, there is a mention of him. But I think the butler's drop is simply called Lionel Henderson, isn't that it? Well, I've been called all sorts, so it could yeah. well be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So he, do, he does feature in the, in the, in the Bill Body book. So, jumping forward a few years, here's the actual car now back at Brooklyn. So, how, yeah. did, how, how did this come about? So, this, this was honestly such a special day for me. So, the guy at, in the actual driver's seat there is a chap called Winston who got in touch with my brother. My brother's in the white shirt. Um, and it turned out that Winston's father sort of did some co-driving or some co-ownership ownership with this car that um, my grandfather also had, and it turns out my grandfather had two Fraser Nashes. Um, and anyway, this one was sort of reunited with us, and it was such a special day because we came here, which is in itself, you know, a special venue, and we sat at the helm of the car that our grandfather had, had driven, and we, unfortunately, we never met our grandfather. Um, his wife, Una, she is very much, was very much part of my life, so I knew Granny, but not my grandfather. So it was almost... You know, it was just a magical experience. And also to, to drive the car the short distance that I did, and you have to get your hand out of the cockpit and change the gear. And, the, I mean, there's no way that I could have... I can't even imagine racing at high speeds around this track with a, a tiny little bit of leather on your hat. You, you just, you know, being so close to firing off and into the trees. Utter heroes, people who raced in, the, in, in that day and age. Absolutely, but you, you did get to drive it around, around the paddock a little bit, at, at yeah, least. Yeah, exactly. I, honestly, I was just not very fast, but <laughs> it, was, it was really a really lovely, magical thing to have done. I feel very lucky to have done that. So that was your, your, your grandfather then. So starting off your, your own career, um, not, not unusually, um, like many, many others. Oops, went two, two slides there. You... Um, started off in carts, so what, what age were, were you then? So this is me on one of the first ever times I tried a racing cart. So I'm 12 years old in this one, and I think I've got my dad's old racing suit on, so we're just testing it. <laughs> and previous to this, my, so my father, Guy, had been in the British karting team when he was a teenager, and he ended up being a farmer. So 
ever since I was tiny, I used to sit on his knee, drive tractors, and then Dad sort of found an old cart chassis of his in the back of a barn, stuck a lawnmower engine on it, and we went up and down the, the tarmac farm drive. And I was like, Dad, I actually quite, you know, I quite like this. Can we have a go? So he took me to Rye House in Hertfordshire, the karting circuit that he went to, and this is me at Rye House having one of the first ever goes, age 12, in a, in a cart. Fantastic. So another, another picture of you then? This is the me car. when I got a bit more professional. <laughs> <laughs> got a racing suit and matching helmet and all sorts, yeah. So this is, this is me a bit further on. So I raced carts, 100cc carts from the age of 12 to 17 um, and just had a total ball. We raced up and down the country in the back of a van. We took, took the carts, slept in the van sometimes and just had a, you know, a good, a good old-fashioned racing background. And it's pr probably a silly question, but what was, what was your ambition at that, at, at that time? Formula One driver. <laughs> that, that, was, that was absolutely it. Yeah, I definitely wanted to do that. Okay, so Hands up anyone here who wants to be a Formula One driver. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the, 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 the next step then uh, is a formula, lo long since defunct now, <clears throat> but uh, f Formula First. Formula First, yes. Yeah, so this is me aged 17. So I was still at school, I was doing my A-levels, and um, I had just gone from racing carts to the next stage of my amazingly tempting Formula One career, and I went into single-seaters. So this is Formula First, a Ford XR2 engine, um, and it was sort of created by Brands Hatch to be a one-make series for uh -huh. you know, junior, junior drivers to progress. And the Daily Mail were interested in me, which was very sweet, so they sent a photographer along, and this, then I had a page in the Daily Mail, you know, young driver, this, that, and the other. And I went to an all-girls school in Cambridge that was just full of, you know, you're going to be a lawyer, a doctor, this, that, and the other. But they were so fantastic in the late 80s. They put this Daily Mail picture, and they put it in the staff room, and they really sung about it. And I just thought that was, you know, it, looking back, I just thought that was a really lovely thing for them to have embraced, which also gave me time to sneak off school, because I was like, well, look, I'm racing, I'm really busy. <laughs> long, long weekends. Mm. So um, then, then progressing on from, uh, from single-seaters into uh, saloons, this little uh, Clio Cup car. Yes, yeah, so obviously the single-seater career came to a short end, <laughs> because it turns out that you need your stars to align, and you really need luck, money, and talent all to sit at that point for you then to progress to the next level. Because if you think about it, there are 20 people in the whole world who race in Formula One. So the chances of you getting to that tiny pyramid at the top is, is so small. It didn't happen for me, but I managed then to have a, a career in journalism which allowed me to pursue my racing and not pay for it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I have one of these as well, actually, the, the, the original Clio Cup. A lot, lot, lot of fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of fun with old cars. So, has anyone here got Clios or race Clios? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah. We are amongst a few, but please, if you ever get an experience to, to go in one, do. Yeah. So, you, you mentioned the journalism, so we've got an extract here from you with the, uh, the, the Daily Telegraph, but obviously before you got to those d dizzy heights, I guess, there had to be an entry into journalism, so motoring journalism, how did that all come about? So at the same time when my Formula One career failed, <laughs> at the ripe old age of 17, um, I, um, very luckily, I was talking to somebody at an event who worked in the marketing department of a big publishing company called EMAP, which at that time did Performance Car Magazine and, and other ones. And they said, look, there's a, car, there's a magazine called Car Mechanics. They're looking for a junior. Might you be interested? I loved writing. I was doing my A-level English. I'd just done my A-level English. And I loved cars. And I just thought, oh, actually, yeah, this sounds really fun. So I went along, had a chat. And they were like, great, we like, what, we like you. Would you like to be editorial assistant for Car Mechanics magazine? Up at EMAP, up in Peterborough. And that's where I started. And then I became staff writer at Practical Classics magazine. Mm -hmm. And I had a staff car, my first ever staff car, Mark I Cortina GT. <laughs> Not quite what an 18, 19 year old would want, but it was rear wheel drive and it, it went sideways on wet roundabouts. So I was very happy. <laughs> 
And then, um, I, I, then I EMAP, did, EMAP had a, a lovely sort of journalism training course. So I got sent away for six months to be a proper journalist and did shorthand and law and government and all of that. And then came back and helped launch Max Power magazine, which then became one of the biggest modified car magazines yeah, that I don't, the history's ever... Is it still going or not? No, no, no and no. I honestly think that, sadly, the modified car market isn't really as big as it was by any stretch, but because the manufacturers cottoned on to the fact that they could sell up, you know, they could upgrade you into like the next best stereo, the next big set of wheels. So they kind of put it all in house and the, the Max Power scene yeah. gently died away. But then I got, a, I got a job on, I feel like I'm really talking too much. No, I'm no. so sorry. <laughs> no, no. That, that's, what, that's what you're here for, uh, Vicky. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and then I got a job, my, my dream job as a road tester on an auto, uh, Car Week magazine, Auto Express magazine and What Car magazine. So I did a few years oh. of being a road tester where I just drove 10 cars a week, tested them, maxed them out, 0 to 60s and was absolutely in my element and then just wrote about them. Mm -hmm. So that was the bulk of my my uh, uh, journalism side of things. And so you've, you've, you've now got to the, the, the main broadsheets, the, the Telegraph, the Times as well, I think you've, you've yep. written for, yeah. Yep, had, had lots of columns in there and still write, you know, for various people. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to journalism and so forth um, in a moment, but of course, um, the next step in your career then was opening up a uh, TV career featuring someone that we, uh, we all know and love. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, if you, whatever industry you're in, it turns out that it's quite, it, it will be quite small, and car journalism and is quite a small one. So I got a phone call one day saying, look, Top Gear TV is, they, they're looking for a girl who can drive. Would you be interested in coming for a screen test? So I was like, yeah, of course. Because I had watched Top Gear all my life. Thursday nights, I was like, Dad, Dad, Top Gear's on, Top Gear's on. So we've all, you know, I've watched it forever. And when, so I did a screen test, and then they obviously got this big bucket, went all the way down to the bottom, went, oh, yep, yeah, she'll do, we'll have her. <laughs> and that was it. So I, I got a job on Top Gear telly, which was absolutely fantastic. So instead of writing about testing cars, I was just on TV talking about them. So that was... And do, do, really do you get any f formal training to, to, to do that? I mean, you mentioned your six-month journalist course. Is there a TV equivalent? No. No. So everything that I ever did on TV was a learning experience, but it got broadcast to three million people every week. <laughs> so, but, but Jeremy has always been really lovely and kind to me and supportive. So there was one time actually after the first item went out on Top Gear, I was still working as a journalist on What Car magazine, and the phone rang at my desk, and I picked it up, and he's like, hello, this is Jeremy Clarkson. I was like, oh, come on, boys, who's taking, who's taking the mickey? Yeah. Looking around the office, and it was Jeremy, and he'd, he'd rung me just to say, look, you know, I thought we did a really great job, welcome, and anything you want, give me a ring. Mm -hmm. So he's been all super lovely, despite what anyone hears about him. <laughs> to me, he's been great. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it, it is a burning question for everybody. What, what, what is he like in, in, in real life to, 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 to work with? For, for me, on a, I can't complain. He was always super supportive, and um, he is a fantastic broadcaster. If you ever read any of his stuff or you just watch the way he can craft a TV show, it, it, it is fantastic what, what he can do. I know he is Marmite. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll maybe touch on Mr. Clarkson again later. So... Top Gear then ended, and your stint on it obviously ended at, at, at the same time then. So you can just talk, talk us through what, what went on then? Yeah. So I was on Top Gear when we had quite a few presenters. So there was sort of Tony Mason doing rallying, Tiff Nadell, Quentin Wilson, Jeremy, and a few others. And the BBC decided that they didn't want cars anymore, so they canned Top Gear. And what, the, roughly when was that? Can you remember? So, that was, so I had been on it then for four or five years. It was about 2002. Okay. And then the next day, a few of us got a phone call. Oh, yeah, so Jeremy had left three years previously. That's right. So he went to do a chat show for BBC Two. So he, he was doing that. And then the new head of BBC was just like, no, I don't really like cars, so we'll can it. <laughs> so then we got Tiff, Quentin and I got a phone call saying, look, we love what you do. This is Channel 5 here. Will you come and make a new car show called Fifth Gear? And we were like, oh, thanks. That's lovely. So we then went and made Fifth Gear, and we are still making it today. <laughs> yeah. 
And then eventually, they, BBC brought Top Gear back, but in the three-man guise that then evolved. So, so, so you, 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 know, you weren't there in the, in the Stig era or the, or the, the, the latter, but so what, what are you, what are you no. doing in, in this? So this yeah. is one of Jeremy's videos that he sort of, he has, he makes. And Tiff and the Stig and I were just hooning around, so. So it, it, was, it was a Top Gear special of, of some sort, it wasn't, it wasn't well, an actual episode? No, it wasn't an actual episode, no, no, it was a, I think it was a DVD, DVD special. That was when everyone got involved. But it, was, it just goes to show that everyone does get on really well, and it is such a small world, so we, nobody can really afford to have any rivalry or anything like that. So There's no, no need for that. So we, we, we know Tiff well. Of course, we had Tiff yeah. here la, la, last year, and he's a Weybridge lad. He's, he's, he was, he's brought, brought, yes. up, brought, yeah, yeah. brought up here. And uh, Daniel Dinner, we also had Perry McCarthy, who was the original Stig. Not, so he was in black, wasn't he? So this, this, yeah. is, this, is, this, is, this is another Stig. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're going to reveal to us which stick no. that was now? <laughs> that was Mark II. Right. That one was Mark II. <laughs> that stick. That stick. That stick came around my house one time and ate fish pie. So I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Oh, and I just have to say about Tiff. I mean, my gosh, what a legend. Honestly, he is my television husband. He is the sweetest, kindest, nuttiest human being. And all he ever goes on about whenever we're away filming is when is lunch when's lunch that's that's his yeah his yeah. thing no t t terrific guy we were had a, a lovely evening here with him a few years ago so you were being a bit modest earlier on about the, the formula one ambitions because um you, you actually did make it to formula one and uh, here you are in a, in a Tyrrell, <laughs> Ma Mallory Park, is it? So this is a, an item I did for Top Gear. It was an, a Formula One car. But has anyone ever been to Mallory Park Racing Circuit? Oh, yes. Let's show it. Many, yeah. many times. I mean, literally two corners, and that's about it. And it's really small. So they're not idiots when they say, we'll give you a Formula One car on the tiniest track that we could possibly find so you can't do any damage. So, yeah, I was lucky enough just to have a, a little blast in that. And... Once I'd made it out of the pits without stalling, I then just focused on the, you, you, just having a lovely time. So it, it was great. I also went to France about the same time and drove an AGS. AGS, yeah. Mm -hmm, I knew that F1 too. car as well. So that was... So I have had a little dabble. Absolutely. And how, how, how was it? I mean, the, the, the power presumably was... Uh... Yeah. The, and the, just the, the size of the tyres that you could just physically see, that was quite epic. But the single-seater stuff, who's driven a single-seater car here? A few. Yeah. They're, they're so alien to whatever we drive on the road because it is so small and narrow and you've got a, either a gear shift here or, you know, you're on paddles. And there's a lot of vibration and a lot of noise coming on, so it is quite... Um, an interesting sensation, but when you've got a stonking great engine as well behind you, it's, it's great fun. So when we were chatting a few weeks ago, uh, you, you told me that th this next experience then almost made you wish you'd uh, changed your career. Oh, my giddy aunt. So this, yeah, I have to remember, remind myself what we were up against. So this, I was working for Top Gear, and Aston Martin had brought out a DB7, and we were like, oh, um... God, who else is bringing out a, a supercar? You know, we, let's do a head-to-head. -head. And they're like, nah. Jaguar, Jaguar. Oh, my gosh, there's a Jaguar jet fighter plane. Great. Let's go to the RAF base, where they are, and let's have Tiff next to you. He'll be driving the Aston Martin, and we'll stick you up in the Jag jet fighter plane. We're like, yes, happy days. <laughs> so so we, we're all in communication, and Tiff's there doing his, you know, usual, I'm going to beat her. She's going to look at it, this, that, and the other. And then, it, so we, we go off. And to start with, to be fair, the Aston has the lick on us, but then I'm just in, obviously, I'm not... Right, I, I'm not piloting this, by the way. I'm just a passenger. And we just hoof off and go out, and then he, the pilot just pulls all these Gs and does fancy stuff, and I was just in the back. It, it, so excited. <laughs> but actually, Je Jeremy had been in an F-15 um, 
plane not long before this and he said to me whatever you do Vic because you are going to forget anything he said write down what you need to say like you know because we had certain things to say that we needed to get across for the ISIM he said stick it down and gaffer tape it up to whatever's in front of you because you will forget so in front of me I have got the words that I needed to say for the film so it was thanks to him that I did that or else I absolutely would have forgotten and then I got back down down to land and I just said to the RAF chaps like, well, oof, 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 sign me up. <laughs> and they were, they were like, okay, so you need to be 25, you, uh, you need to be under 25, you need to, I was like, whoa, 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 and at that point I was 25 turning 26, so that was, that was it. But I, I, that definitely would have been something that I would have liked a lot. So pu 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 pulling all that G can, can do certain things to your stomach, but, well, no, you, but you were okay, were you? Oh, yeah, because yeah. you wear this G suit, okay? Right. So you've got a G suit, and it basically, it grips you at various points along your body, so it's kind of like being squeezed to keep the blood, you know, From in your... to your feet? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So every time we were moving around, I was just getting squeezed all over the place. It was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so... So is, 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 that, is that the Aston that they'd put no, the race in? This is another Aston, honestly. I had to, I've done so many. So this Aston, they said this is the fastest Aston Martin ever. Over, at, at that time? At that time. Yeah. Over 200 miles it can do. So it's the Vanquish S. So we've got, it's a 0 to 62 in 4.8 seconds, V12 engine. I was like, oh, great. So we went to an airfield to test its 200 mile an hour top speed. I've never done 200 miles an hour, so I was super excited to be doing this. So the runway we went, it was an old airfield, which was two miles long. Going along, going along. Went all the way up to 178 miles an hour. And I was like, Phew. just nothing, nothing else. We had grown-ups there who'd got, you know, telemetry gear and stuff like that, and they worked out that, to, that the rate of acceleration for that car, I would need another two miles for it to creep up to 200 miles an hour, which obviously we didn't do, and I wasn't going to do a UE at 178 miles an hour <laughs> to go. So, so that um, sadly did not make it. It didn't, did didn't live up it. to its reputation then? No, exactly. So Anyone here own an Aston Martin? Anyone here done 200 miles an hour? I'm in good company. <laughs> not, not on the ground, anyway. Yes. So back to, uh, to, to writing, etc. So you, you, you brought out this book um, some, some, some years ago now, actually. Indeed. 2010. So I am an author, which is a lovely thing to say. I've always been excited about seeing my words in print, and I still get excited today when I write something and it, and it, it ends up you know, on, on paper. So this was a book that I, I wrote... And believe you me, coming up with 100 cars is quite, <laughs> it's quite a lot. How do, you, how do you know that one is going to be 74th compared to, you know, 62, something like that? So that was quite... But it, was, it was a lovely thing to do. And um, it also coincided with my first pregnancy. So it was a lovely thing to be able to do without hooning around, um, you know, going sideways anywhere. I was just writing about cars. So that was, a, that was really good. So I think I think Vicky, another Vicky Butler Henderson book is is over, overdue. Any any plans in that direction? Well, <laughs> I have been taking photographs this evening for uh, inclusion in a possible possible something. Good, good. Your 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 uh, your autobiography then, I guess. Your motoring and journalism well, autobiography. Well, Tiff's done one. Jason Plato's done one. So I think, well, you know, it's about time. It's about time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to see how tonight goes. So you are my tester audience for <laughs> for my life. <laughs> so I'm um, back back to racing then, back uh, competing at uh, at Silverstone. So what is what is this event? So this is. I've always wanted to drive a Ferrari. Anyone here? Who else has always wanted to drive a Ferrari? You, you mean on, on a circuit, obviously? Yes, yeah. Yeah, race, sorry, race, on a race yeah. one, yeah. So I've always wanted to race one. So this is an F430. So it's in the GT Cup. So I did a couple of races at Brands Hatch. So it's me, other Ferraris, uh, Porsche 911 GT3s, etc. So again, I was filming it. See, this is what I mean about being so lucky to race for free. I mean, you know, I didn't even have to pay to race a Ferrari. 
Um, I did repay them by coming second and third in my races. So Very I have good. some I have some trophies and was on the podium for both of them. So is this is Brands Hatch. Brands Hatch, yeah. Okay. Yep. Coming up to the hairpin. No. Yeah. Which is one of the most sublime racing cars. Just so easy, so powerful, really engaging and fun and terrific noise. Lovely. So another racing uh, first that you achieved in the in the Maserati. So can you tell us how, how that, that all came yeah, about? Yes. So this is the Maserati th uh, 3200 GT and it was at Silverstone. It was ahead of the Silverstone Formula One Grand Prix. So we were racing at like, I don't know, 8.30 in the morning and then the Formula One race was, you know, going on at, at one o'clock later on. So I was teamed up with a brilliant driver called Matthew Marsh and it was a one make series and we ended up winning and I became the first woman ever to win a Maserati race in the history of Maserati. So wow. that was all quite cool. <laughs> And, uh, so <clears throat> there you are, s s celebrating on the uh, yeah. on, on the podium. Has anyone ever had champagne on their clothing? Yeah. yeah. You need to wash it really quickly, or else it goes mouldy and stinks. And yeah, particularly on a three-layer uh, fireproof overalls, it is. And don't ever get it in your eyes as well, because it really stings. <laughs> Just drink it. You know, it's much much better. Exactly. <laughs> Um, actually, later on that day, the Formula One race, so I'm there up on the top seven of the podium. Later on, Michael Schumacher was on that podium. And it, it was so lovely to stand on there, look at the, you know, look at the big grandstands, which were filling up nicely by the time we'd finished. Because then you and, knew were there. Yeah, they'll all come to see you. Well, the national anthem, the, the British national anthem was playing. It was just terrific. And they probably thought, well, we're not hearing that again today. <laughs> and they'd be right. <laughs> So uh, you have a brother, of course, who, uh, who, who, who races as well. Charlie, very successful uh, mi mi mini racer. So um, yep. ba battle of the sexes, battle of the siblings as well. Yes. So this is an article that um, I wrote for the Sunday Times because, amazingly, so my brother is six years younger than me and he started racing when he was eight and I started racing when I was 12. But he and I, we competed you know, at the same karting events, but we were always in different classes. And then I went on and did other races and he had a single seater career and touring cars as well, he raced in and then became a mini champion. And it, we'd never ever had a race together, ever. So this mini opportunity came about. Um, he was racing in it and he was fighting for the title this particular year. And I was in the, this, well, you won't see it yet. So I was in another car. Th th this one here? This one here. I mean, yeah. look at that. Lift off, flame out. Yes. <laughs> so I was racing this one, which was a sort of, you know, a journalist could come in and write about it, you write about the races, you know, if they got a racing licence. So I was there. I qualified 10th. Charlie was up front. And I've always watched him from the sideline you know, for, as a proper spectator, it was the weirdest thing being on the grid. So I'm in 10th and I'm looking ahead, looking at my brother going, I really hope he makes a good start. And they're like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> oh. So it was just so bizarre. And then I thought, right, I've got to focus on my own race, which I did. But each lap I did throw my eyes forward, so long as I had some time and I wasn't fighting anyone off, had some time to look ahead. And it was just, it was really lovely. It was so special to, mm -hmm. to share that experience. Mm -hmm. It was great. And he won, which was lovely. <laughs> and wh where did you finish? Can we I ask? think I finished, I was top 10, so maybe ninth or 10th. Oh, that's pretty good, your first mini race. Um, yeah. So do you ever contemplate racing together, like uh, in, a, in a longer distance race, a two-diver? No, no that, will be, that would be the next logical step. Thank you for putting that in my head, Harry. <laughs> yeah. No, no problem. So carrying on racing, talking of long distance races, odd, oddly enough, um, this is a, a long distance race that you took part in, I think. Were you, did you win it? We did. So this is Tiff Nadell, me, um, and we had an, another couple of really good drivers as well. And this was a 24-hour race at Silverstone in, in the Brit Car Championship. I mean, the car looks a bit battered at the end of that. I love cars yeah. at the end of 24 hours. I love them. They're just battle-weary, dirty, and it was like, you know what, I've put in a hard graft. <laughs> um, so this is fantastic. In, in a Honda Accord, we won our class, which was wonderful. But honestly, racing at night, has anyone ever 
I mean, driving at night, racing at night, it is a really, yeah, it's a really mad thing because the lights do stupid things to your brain because it, they sort of diminish distances. And when you're racing in a 24-hour race, you're usually racing with other cars which are faster than you in a faster class or slower than you. And it's, that's quite a tricky thing. So that was an exhausting 24 hours. I slept well after that. So these are the, the chaps that I race with, yeah. So James Kay, who did touring cars. Mark Lemmer, who now runs a really successful GT um, team, runs Lamborghinis. So it was just really fun. And that's lovely, actually, teamwork, doing something together. And also, it, the flip side is that you feel that the pressure of not wanting to let anybody down. So there is that. Fortunately, we did okay, so it's all right. <laughs> so you, was, was Le Mans an, an ambition? It was, yeah, it was. It was, but never... Not, not, never not realised yet? No, not realised yet. No, but you have the licence, you have an international licence, yeah. I've only, I've only got a national A at okay. the minute. But if the yeah. opportunity came along, I'm sure you'd be, you'd be up for this it. This girl can do. <laughs> <laughs> So, so stick, sticking with tour, touring car t type, uh, or, or I suppose sports cars, we'd yeah. call them. Yeah. So this is a Honda NSX. Who's driven an NSX on the road? Yeah, lovely. This this is a sort of slightly lighter, stripped out version of it, but just a terrific bit of kit. Really lovely. I just love the. I love their shape, mm -hmm. and I don't often see racing NSXs. So this was. I was really lucky to race this one. There was a Senna version of that car, wasn't there? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I've, seen, I've seen that when we when we were working at Goodwood. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously the the life you lead uh, brings you into contact with um, various stars from from other 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 tall, walks of life. Tall stars. So this is James Martin, the TV chef, and this is an item for Fifth Gear. So we had we I had nothing to do with it. The producers said. Um, we are going to get a £150,000 Mercedes SLS. We're going to stick a knife onto it, on the, on the bonnet, and we're going to get, take you to Rockingham Racing Circuit. We're going to put a cone on the middle of an, in the apex of a corner. We're going to stick a cucumber on top of it, and we're going to want you to go sideways on a slide and chop this cucumber off with the knife in front. <laughs> and when you've done that, you're going to then teach James Martin how to do it. <laughs> Well, so when when uh, well. so when uh, the uh, Top Gear or, or our now Grand Tour team say the, the producer told us we're going to do X Y Z, that actually sounds quite authentic. Is what you yeah, just said there? Because there is no way that I would have come up with that at all. So so they did they did come up with that. So, and so, so we have a little video then. Well, we, we do. I mean, because I'm really fearful that I'm boring everyone to death. But no. we can have a three minute reprise, and we've actually got my um, teaching James how and, to do it. And, and you doing it yourself, of course. So. Do you want to see it? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I think I need to... There we go. So the knife is attached, the cucumber is in place. I think it's time I show the chef how easy this is. <laughs> so we're going to take the cucumber off and we're going to put it this isn't easy. Getting with the car to slide accurately requires perfect car control. <laughs> that was a proper, proper job as well. Do you know what? That's one of the best things I've ever achieved in a car. I'm so proud. Right, you might not be doing it. It's my turn now. Hold sight, everyone. This could be spectacular. Oh, it was clear James needs a little bit more encouragement. He needs to be more of a You need to always get that phone lock. Tall about. Turn in. Bundle full of throttle. As he starts to slide, turn to the direction where you're going. And then feather the throttle, so it's... Bit like playing, playing the drums, drums doing, doing everything at once. Yeah. <laughs> Let's There's so much power with that thing that if you give it too much welly and don't correct it, it, it just spins around on you. Too much! Yeah. So, unless you had a knife on the back, it would have been all right. <laughs> 
You sort of mentioned it earlier on, and you sort of mentioned as well on that the, the, the power of the car. I was mentioning we did a, a track day in southern Spain a little while ago, and you know, cars these days have just got so powerful. Like Porsche GT3, RS, whatever else it is. You know, as I said to some of the guys there, you know, James Hunt won a world championship in a car less powerful than these cars that you're now driving on the road. I mean, yeah. a generation ago, it was unthinkable people yeah. were driving five, six hundred horsepower cars. Yeah on the road. Yeah, that Mercedes Air 6.2 litre V8, a thumping great thing. So I mean, how, how, how have we got here? I mean, do you, do, are you in, in agreement with, with road cars having uh, that, that, that sort of power, that sort I of mean, performance? Car, when you look at electric cars, they've got like a thousand horsepower, which scares me rigid because a 17 year old could go and buy that. That's, that is the worry that I have. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm all about power. <laughs> very happy but I, I would love I would love better training mm -hmm. that and I'd love you know a skid car training um, and to, to be included in the test and I would love everyone to drive lorries ride a motorbike you know at least once or twice so that they can get a perspective of mm -hmm. of every other road user mm -hmm. that would be my but even then, by, by comparison, when you were looking at your little Formula First back then and Formula Ford and Sport 2000 and everything, you know, th th those cars had about 130 horsepower. And that, that's what you did. You, know, you went racing with 130 horsepower. Yeah. Now you have to have like five or 600 horsepower to go, yeah. to go racing. I mean, the growth has just been phenomenal. Yeah. Well, even to look at hot, hot hatches, you know, in the 80s, you had little, you know, little 205 GTIs, nimble, light, fantastic power to weight ratio. And today, you know, we, we're a lot heavier because mm -hmm. of safety. So you know, you sort of make, make more power for it. Mm, a bit of an, an arms race, and then the brakes have to be upgraded and everything, obviously, as well, and, and so forth, yeah. So, well, we'll maybe come back to some of those points li later on. So your celebrity experiences continued then? Lovely Ronnie O'Sullivan. So this, Ronnie want, was interested in buying a Merc, so we were like, I know, let's get Ronnie on the show, and then we can show him um, a Mercedes. So this is a C63 AMG, and we were at Castle Coombe. And I was teaching him how to do donuts and stuff like that. Um, but he, he really likes cars. And after this, actually, he went on and got his racing license and he's done a bit of racing, which is lovely. But as we were sort of hooning around um, on, on the track, he said something that has never left me. He said, when you're racing, he said, you know, when you're going out, do you know that you're on a really quick lap? Do you know that, you know, you, you've just hooked it up straight away? And I was like, yeah, yeah, pretty much. And then he said, yeah. He said, when I pop my first ball, I know I'm going to do a 147 yeah. on that table. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So he, he was great. And a few years afterwards, actually, Ronnie has done some presenting on Fifth Gear. So he's right. done a few bits with us on that, mm -hmm. which was lovely. So any, any rallying, Vicky? Have you done, done, done any rallying? I have, yeah. I did, I've done the Elgin Rally in Scotland in a Peugeot and I had the best slash worst co-driver in the world, <laughs> Tiff Nadell. <laughs> <laughs> Tiff spent, I mean, to start with, he was peeved that he wasn't behind the wheel and then he spent the first few stages going, 
going, go on, go, you know, go faster, go faster, go faster. And then the rest of the day, slow down, slow down, slow down. <laughs> And because as a co-driver's job, you have to get out of the car and do all the timing and stuff like that. He hated doing that. I just sort of sat back, oh, yeah. <laughs> just in between stages, and he's just running around, getting paperwork signed. And so I relished that, and he, he did not. But that was, that was good fun, yeah. I think I've done a couple of other rallies as well, but I can't... I, I think, did, did you do something with Louise? Yes. Louise Goodman. Yes. We had Louise Goodman. a little while ago. You, yes. you two did something together. We did, yes. yes. Was I her co driver? I think I might have been her co driver. I think you co drove for her. At yes. a yeah, that was in sort of Southampton. Yeah, that was, that was good fun. She's lovely too. She's yeah. really nice. Yeah. But also, my, my, my two rally things I was friends with Richard Burns, who, was the, who went on to be the world champion. And he was doing a shakedown at Monaco, and I was a passenger for him doing a shakedown in a Subaru. And one, we were going round mountain, you know, passes and just looking down and there was nothing but a sheer drop on my side. Feeling terrified, but unbelievably felt so secure because Richard's car skills were mind blowing. And I've also been lucky enough as well to, not on a rally stage, but I've been, um, alongside Colin McRae as well oh, wow. in, in various things, both of whom obviously hugely missed, but yeah, fantastic talents. I mean, wow, really real magical gifts for driving that they had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's incredible. Those two giants of British rallying and uh, we've, we've lost them both yeah. within a few years. Yeah. And rallying now, you know, does anyone follow rallying much? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, a few yeah, of us. Yeah, but it was, you know, back in the sort of the Richard and the Colin day, it was, you know, wonderful. It wasn't for our Formula English. One back in the day. I mean, really, th yeah. th those days. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, very, very difficult. Uh, hard to understand how the manufacturers can justify the money they spend on it with how little publicity really it gets these yeah, days. It is mad, isn't it? So, uh, lots of chat about, about two wheels, or four wheels rather, what, 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 what about so two, two wheels? Are you, are you a biker so girl I, as well? Yeah, so I own a Ducati Monster 750, this isn't it, um, and I am amazing in a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's about as far as my talent goes. But uh, Tiff and I did do a day at the Ron Haslam School at Donington, Donington yeah. which was fantastic. So we, Tiff learned to get his knee down, followed by his arse and his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> but at least he got his knee down, which he was really pleased about. I didn't get my knee down. But yeah, we have done sort of the odd silly things on, uh, on, on fifth gear, so, which has been great fun, including how fast can Tiff and I go in a straight line. He, at one point, on a, on a Kawasaki, what, what, a Kawasaki ZZR 1400, yeah. He did 156 miles an hour. Oof, that's quick on a bike. I did 145 <laughs> <laughs> because I've got a brain <laughs> <laughs> and got a bit scared. But bikes are fantastic. And what I love about riding a bike is that it's, you're so in the moment. There's nothing to distract you. So I, I do enjoy that. I, I just wish I was better. And what, what sort of things do you do in your, 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 your monster? Do you, do you tour I on it? I look at it a lot. <laughs> uh, I don't often, I don't have the time, sadly, to be super self-indulgent and go on a, a little mission on my own, but it, it looks very beautiful and um, it hasn't done many miles. But it sounds great and it's got a low seat, so, which is nice for right, yeah. not blessed with height. Yes, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't ride a monster. I'm like, like I'm riding a Shetland pony. You know, I'm way, 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 way too big for a monster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, you'd have to, you know, up carrying it. But they are great. They're fantastic. Who rides a bike here? Oh, lots. Yes. Yeah, P yeah. P Peter here, who you were That's talking it. to earlier, could organise a little ride out from the RAC oh, at Epsom. Oh, great. If you ever fancy doing that one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll organise yeah. that. No, no bends. <laughs> no corners. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So another, another legend of oh, two-wheel world. Dougie Lampkin. So he, if you've ever been to the Goodwood Festival of Speed or any other event, he's the guy who hops around trialling bikes on the roof of the Goodwood house and stuff like that. So he, I went to learn how to do it properly <laughs> on, on, on a school that he ran. So that was, that was huge fun as well. Mm -hmm. I, really do, I really do wish that I was, you know, as good on two wheels as I am on four. Mm -hmm. Because I just I love seeing motorbikes pulling wheelies and doing stuff. 
And what, what, what sort of things, I mean, you learned, I mean, what sort of things did you progress to doing on, on, on that A course? few jumps. Yeah, okay. and she's and she's sort of you know going up hills and like really you know steep steep hills. Did it, yeah, that's <laughs> just not really fun. And he's a lovely human being as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, very memorable at Goodwood, as you, as you say. So, um, what what's in your garage? Well, Can you tell us what cars you have? So this is my little pride and joy. So this is my nine nine seven nine eleven GT three. Um, and we've had it for, I don't know, maybe about 15 years or so. And I go, I drive, I'm lucky enough to drive all the modern stuff. However, I'll go back to this car and it just fits. And Porsche, this was one of Porsche's best, in my opinion. The engagement that you get as a driver, manual gearbox, the, the weight distribution, it just, it just snaps into place all around you. And it still remains one of the best handling cars I have ever driven. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, and it's what, or oh, it's 2007 model, so. Yeah, yeah, so not, 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 not the latest. So what, what sort of horsepower is it? That is about 400, just over 400. Mm -hmm. So yeah, not one of these, as I was saying earlier, these are 600 plus uh, yeah, not, not yeah, models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, in a way, that's enough. That's, you know, that is, and I don't particularly need any more in that. I don't okay, want a turbocharged yeah. or supercharged on it mm -hmm. because it's just a, a fantastic package. Mm -hmm. It is lovely. Who's driven a 997, 911? Yeah, I think John yeah. over here Would one. you agree with me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's just super. So, so what? Has she? Oh, tell her, bravo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good, good choice. So what, 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 what else have you got uh, in, in the garage then? So I've got a, a couple of Range Rovers. <laughs> so one is an, is an old knackered Range Rover, 2003. But I brought my first child home in it from the hospital and it is now like the dog car. So I've got two great big Rhodesian Ridgebacks and they are, you know, a, a mini that have, which doesn't fit. So we've got the Range Rover for them, which is a 4.4 litre V8. And then I've also got a diesel Land Rover as well. So I'm ticking the sports car box, a petrol and a diesel. And I've, I've got an electric car. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, it's a Mustang. It's a Mustang, yes. Am I allowed? Of so I've got a, a Mustang Mach-E. So this is my first foray into electric cars, which is fantastic because I'm learning about its foibles, about the, the you know, charging system, the network, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And interestingly, my children, I've got one just a teenager and one a bit younger, they really like the green credentials of it. So they are aware, but equally they love the beast, as we call this one. So they love going out in that as well. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, we'll maybe come, come back to the electric cars again, because obviously yeah. it's quite, quite a big topic. Controversial. So in terms of what you're, what, what you're doing the, these days, now you, you are the, the, the car girl. So, yep, so in lockdown, I, as everyone does, they're like, oh, gosh, what should we do? Um, so I started a YouTube channel called The Car Girl, where I just thought, oh, I'll just drive cars that I'm really interested in, because... You know, fifth gear, we produce fifth gear, but it only takes up sort of three or four months of the year. So right. throughout the rest of the year, I, I quite like to scratch my driving itch. So I set up this YouTube channel, which is ticking along very nicely. I produce about one film per month. And I have roped in my husband, um, who does the filming of it. And my husband is usually uh, nothing to do with actual filming because he is the series director for the Grand Tour. So he's the one in charge of helicopters, minicams, presenters, locations, logistics, music, editing. Um, and, and I get him to hike around a camera. <laughs> so it's, it's very much a small operation. And I, I hope that it brings you know, people a, a bit of entertainment along the way um, and just allows me just to you know, stretch my legs a bit. So I really like writing the scripts for it and being involved in you know in how it looks so and there's, a, there's no sort of conflict or overlap with what you do in fifth gear then you, you're able to do your own thing independently yes of that. yeah 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 exactly i mean if if i film a, a car for fifth gear i wouldn't have it yeah. probably on my channel but 
but I've got all sorts on there, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, electric cars, um, discussions on, you know, how to make your home, you know, available, uh, ready for an electric car or hybrids or whatever, and I'm jumping a Ranger, Raptor, pickup truck, all sorts, just, I'm just having fun. Sounds like a lot of fun, yeah. So we, we talked about fifth gear, so I mean, we're sort of back on the electric car story, aren't we? Because um, a while ago, fifth gear kind of rebranded itself and became, if I'm not blocking up, became um, fifth gear uh, recharged um, and therefore was concentrating very much on the, on the electric side of things. Uh, and then when we were chatting a couple of days ago in, in the run up to, to this evening, you were mentioning that the, the branding is now reversed. You've now dropped the recharged thing and back to just sort of plain um, fifth gear. Is, is that tying in with the sort of the whole electric car thing so run, running out of steam a little bit, if that's the wrong no, analogy? No, I think, I think so fifth gear, for, so for two, the last two seasons, we, we've been fifth gear recharge, where we've had each test, we had an electric car or a hybrid element in it, but potentially as well, you know, testing it against a normal V8 petrol or something like that. And I think they were just seeing how the market was for it, because, you know, we're in this evolution of, of you know working out where we all sit so we were just reflecting the marketplace mm -hmm. um but, and then we've just gone back to well it's, it's a grown-up decision it's got really nothing to do with me um so we've gone back to being fifth gear so, and we are filming currently for the next series so we go on the discovery channel and on quest and we should be on air in um in the summer Good. and um, uh, and don't worry <laughs> Last week, I was testing a Lamborghini Urus and a Lamborghini Huracan Storato four-wheel drive thingy, a little sort of rally car. And then yesterday, I was in Wales filming a Ineos Grenadier against a Land Rover Defender. So all, th all bases are covered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it seems to me that you know, pretty much every day you read something about you know, the whole electric car phenomenon all, all being in trouble. I mean, this, this is from the Telegraph this morning, actually. Um, electric car sales plummeted across Europe last year. Uh, sales of battery cars uh, dropped by 28.9% uh, in Germany, Europe's largest economy, and 11% overall. Uh, thir only 13% of new registrations were, were, were electric. So the, the momentum behind the whole electric thing just seems to be tailing off quite, I mean, I, I read something like that ne nearly every day these days. I mean, what's, what, what's happening in, in your view? Well, I mean, if, if, there are other statistics that will say that in the UK, we've sold 3% you know, of electric cars uh, in the whole population, and, and that's growing. It's a number that's growing. Like a couple of years ago, it was 1%, then 1.5 to 3%. Electric cars sales are not massive, but the headlines are, definitely are, which makes us think, oh, maybe there are more electric cars than ever. But I really wish that we went for green fuels, renewable fuels, that you could put into the BP stations, the shell garages, and you and I... Yeah, 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 yeah. And that we could run our V8, V12s, everything, forever. I, I, I really strongly believe that will come, because I can't envisage 100% of us running an electric car it's just not viable. No, the, the infrastructure is nowhere near. Uh, no. That, so that I think a, a lovely bit of electric, super, yeah, great, because you get instant torque as soon as you put your foot down. So that's, you know, you do get a nice bit of rush from that. So that's ticking a bit of a box. Then the majority of us running on renewable green fuels and then some hydrogen for lorries and buses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I will be London Mayor before you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we, we had Karun on the uh, uh, here a few a few weeks ago, and uh, yeah. obviously he, he wor works with yeah. you part time on, on on fifth gear as well. And his his opinion on that subject was that he, the government should tell the manufacturers that you know there's like emissions targets, and you go and sort it out rather than you know the, the mandate of, of of electric cars. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Here, here, mm -hmm. here, here. But I mean, d don't get discouraged because there are companies who are investing in renewable fuels, green fuels, and Sebastian Vettel, who owns the Williams F1 car that Nigel Mansell had, he, convert, he, he didn't do anything to it, but he, ha he is running it on, at events with renewable green fuel. Mm -hmm. So if he can do it in an F1 car, it will come to us, okay? Stay strong, have faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And the, uh, the, the Beast of Turin ran at Goodwood on, on renewable yes. fuel as well. Yes. So yep. engines of all, all shapes and sizes. Yeah.
exactly. Yeah. And wh wh where are you on, on, on conversions, like taking a classic E-type or something and putting, oh, putting an electric motor oh. into it? Where are who, you on that? Who says take an engine out? No. OK. Who says take an engine out, put it with electric, if that's the only way that that car can survive? No. no. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I think so long, as, so long as there are more original cars than there are converted, if you're going to save a few, I don't, I don't mind. Mm -hmm. But I would quite like those engines to be taken out and put as a centerpiece somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then it can be put back in again, you know, when needed. Is it, I think the King has one, hasn't he? I think, did, didn't he? Yes, an, an Aston Martin. An Aston Martin, I think. Yes. Yeah, I think yeah, the yeah, King's yeah. Aston was converted, yeah. Yeah. So, so your take is that if, if the engine itself is, is beyond, but, uh, beyond repair... That, honestly, that's... well, I mean, it's such a thing. When does a car become a car? What's its heart? What's its soul? Is it when the engine goes in? Is it when the chassis and the wheels? It's a, I love this question because I don't have the answer. It's uh, Cars and Philosophy. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <gasps> it's my, my, my other book. <laughs> <laughs> Vicky, thank you very much indeed. A big hand, please, for, for Vicky. Oh, no, thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure there will be a few questions, and uh, we have uh, Lorraine here at the ready with the mic. Who's got a, a question for, for Vicky? P Peter's got one here, straight off the mark. Oh, jeez. Hi. That, that was fantastic. Thank Aww. you very much. I think Aww. everybody's really, really enjoyed it. Um, the first thing is that you and Charlie should come fun cup racing. Yes, so, yes. Uh, we can nail that. Um, the next thing is you are awesome at the um, drifting, donating, etc. It's something I've admired. Uh, anybody can do that. You and Tiff are the experts. Any suggestions as to how mere mortals like ourselves could actually learn how to I do know. it? Well, the, I learned by pulling out of... Um, lay-bys on country roads <laughs> in rear-wheel drive cars and that's when I, I first started first started doing that I would love to say go to a car park oh there's one out here <laughs> <laughs> I mean I'd love to say go to a car park and do donuts but that's really highly irresponsible but I as probably is hooning it out of a lay-by but that's my my thing. But what, do it so that you are in the middle. So if you're in a right-hand drive, normal UK car, make sure you turn to the right so you get more of a sort of a, a swing out and that you're sort of in the centre of things. So do, do that one first. <laughs> have I said anything too naughty? <laughs> okay. Well, we might, we might have some trouble getting it onto YouTube now that you've okay. said that. So um, <laughs> <laughs> any other questions for, for Vicky? So you've got one sort of half, halfway down there, Lorraine. Oh, be kind to me. Please don't ask me anything difficult. A somewhat uh, selfish question, because I would be regarded as one of the kingpins of Formula First. Oh. So what did Formula First teach you? Please tell me more. What did you do with Formula First? Uh, when I was ops direction, director at Brands at the time, wow. ran all the car racing, and Formula First was the championship that I put together. Oh. Thank you so much. Honestly, thank you. Oh, wow. Where are you? Can you stand up so I can see you? Oh, brilliant. Hi, hi, hi. Oh, I loved it because it was my first, um, you know, my, it was my first experience of, of a single-seater racing car because I'd only ever raced carts where you are 90 miles an hour, on the ground, no, no you know, not much body work, no safety harness, and all of a sudden you're in these cars that, you know, that are doing so 120, 125 miles an hour? Uh, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, obviously, the next stage up would be Formula Ford, which is, you know, is sort of a bit more, a bit more sophisticated. So Formula First was never the most sophisticated. But so many um, racing drivers cut their teeth, in a way, on, on racing Formula First. Oliver Gavin? Yeah. Raced Formula First. And Be Ben Edwards. We ben Edwards, Edwards yeah, yeah, who's now the commentator okay, yeah. for mm -hmm. F1 Bits and Bobs. Yeah, so I thank you. It was an utter hoot. <laughs> and I, I actually had a multi-sport, didn't you see? That was the, the sports oh, car the version of the Formula First. Yeah, I raced one of those for a few years, so yeah. it developed into the, uh, the sports car side yeah, as yeah. well. 
Hi. Thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. Um, oh, it's thank a you. Bit of a simple question, I admit, but of all the shootouts you did for Fifth Gear, which was the most enjoyable? <sighs> That's such a difficult question. I think one of the most memorable was, uh, I think, it was a m more modern Ford Focus against a Escort Cosworth with the big whale tail. Oh my gosh, I fell in love with that, with the whale tail. That made me, I am a nutter for a spoiler. I love a spoiler. And it's thanks to that car, <laughs> that big T-bar, because this Ford came from the Ford press office it, and it had done about, oh, it hadn't done that many miles. So it felt like it was new, even though it was 15, 20 years old. And just swinging that about, it wasn't the most dynamic thing and it wasn't quite how I remembered it, but it was still highly flickable and fun. And I really enjoyed that, I think, because my, you know, my passion for whale tails. So, yeah, I think that was it. Thank you. I that um, a few things you'd like to do. Could you tell us what you, you know, any, any burning ambitions that you've got outstanding? Oh gosh, anybody, I, definitely I'd like to race a Lamborghini. Le Mans would be lovely. Um, oh, just to have more time. <laughs> that would be good fun. Yeah, I think racing a Lamborghini, that might be my, my, next, my next thing to do. And maybe get my knee down on a bike. <laughs> Thank you. Another question here. Oh, Lorraine's heading back yeah. to the back. Hi, Vicky. Um, so it was great to see the early pictures of you go-karting and stuff, and you've driven everything beyond that. But what was the first road-legal car you drove? Now, that is a very good question, because I wasn't particularly road-legal. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll talk later. <laughs> Astra GTE. Yeah. B very sporty. Yeah. I also tried to left-foot brake. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Vicky, um, when, when are we going to see you in Rallycross? I'm heavily involved with Retro Rallycross. We'd love to see you Oh, wow. There. I did do a Rallycross race at Silverstone. For, for, it, was, it was a big celebrity thing, and I've got no idea how I got involved. Probably 25 years ago, when they, did, when they had the figure of eight course at Silverstone, and the Porsche... Um, centre is now where it used to be and it used to have a, a bridge where you crossed over and under and there was me, Louise Aitken Walker, right. Stig Blumquist, Derek Warwick and a few other fancy people and I loved it, it was so much fun and I've also had a go in a Peugeot 205 at Lydon Hill, they've done a, a slight sort of half and half running course, yes please, yes please. <laughs> Thank you. Are, you. are you still going, Lorraine? We've got another question. Any, any other questions for, for Vicky? No. Oh, oh, got a few coming up. You're still okay to keep going, yeah, Vicky? Yeah, totes. So long as they're not too difficult for my <coughs> tiny brain. Uh, hi, Vicky. I'd just like to know what do you think is the best racing series on at the moment? <gasps> oh, and that's if, a good and if question. It's, and if it's not Formula One, what do you think of the current state of that? Yeah. Uh, well done. Very, very, very good question. So I am an F1 fan, and I always have been, but oh my gosh, I, ooh, I struggle. I have been struggling for the last 18 months to, to still say, yeah, it's great, everyone should watch it. Because oh, it's not, it's, not, it's processional. Uh, but I've also lived through the eras where, you know, Michael Schumacher was dominant for many years. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, it, it's, it, it was a bit more exciting then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were, you know, the, there are new rule changes coming up in 2026, which I'm sure perhaps Karun has spoken about. We could yeah. look back yeah. on YouTube yeah. and, and see what he has to say about that. But I'm a bit fed up of having to wait for another rule change. It's like today, now, I want proper racing now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just I, one, one, one team so dominant, obviously, that, yeah. that, 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 that spoiled it. What, what about Andretti it? should have been allowed in, so they should have allowed another extra team in, because we all want it, mm. but a small you know, m m minority of people obviously want to keep the money for themselves. But mm. I think another team would definitely open things up, because there are so many drivers waiting, waiting for a shot at F1, mm -hmm. and 
and another team would at least allow a couple more chairs to move around. But I'm very excited to see Lewis at Ferrari. I think fair play to him that he was like, yep, yeah, it's coming to the end of my days. Let's go for it. I was, I was very pleased for him that he made that decision. His, his motivation to keep going after so many years is absolutely incredible. Well, as a Fernando Alonso, honestly, that man still is just incredible. And I love listening to him <laughs> on post-race interviews because he's, he's such an old, wise chap. And I love his dirty tactics on the track. <laughs> Imagine all the stuff that we don't know about that he's managed to get away with. Amazing. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Lorraine? I think there's one. Hey, Vicky. Um, you said you like modifying cars, so I wanted to know which car under your ownership have you modified the most? And second question, did you declare those mods on your insurance? <laughs> <laughs> No to that second question. <laughs> and the only thing I ever really did was, so I own a, I forgot, I own a Mark I Ford Fiesta, 957cc. My granny, Lionel Butler Henderson's wife, Una, so Lionel, um, Una, granny had it from new, 1978 she had it. And what is lovely is that her name is on the, on the paperwork and, and my name too, so that's sort of never going anywhere. And I worked for Max Power magazine when I had that and I might have put a sticker in the back window. <laughs> Honestly, that was it. It's pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hiya. Um, fantastic to see you in here. This is absolutely amazing. Oh, thank you. That and, means um, a lot. Thank so, you. being a bit controversial, as soon as you brought it up, um, E-Extreme and places like that, any... What, what are my thoughts and all on plans? That? Yeah, Katie Mullins and all that. Yeah, I know. Honestly, it's so lovely to see that. I love seeing cars move around and jump around. I, you know, and absolutely fair play to the series that they make sure that there's a woman involved and a man at the helm. That I love to see that. I think that's great and can only do good for the sport. But I haven't had the time or perhaps inclination to follow it properly as you know, as a as a true. Say again. Maybe as a sideline, who knows? <laughs> as, yeah, who knows? Okay, just a couple, couple, couple more questions here. Hi, Vicky. Um, quick question. You talked about your experience on bikes and you enjoyed straight lines. Have you ever considered getting in a top fuel, fuel drag strip? <gasps> I have considered it, and it's been a very quick no thank you very much. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyone here been in a top fueler? Yeah, no. Honestly, those, I bow down to anyone who can step in a, what is a petrol tank and, and hoof off and expect a parachute to stop them after a quarter of a mile. It's amazing. I'm in awe and it is something I would never, ever do. It actually scares me. So, would, would you do it? Would you? Good boy. <laughs> Any other questions? I think one just in the middle of the front row here, Lorraine. Oh. Hi, Vicky. Absolutely brilliant talk. Thank you. Oh, thank have you. you been invited or have you a race down at Goodwood in the either revival or the members meeting? That is an invitation only event and I have not been invited. <laughs> Oh, thank, no, I haven't. But I, I've obviously lived vicariously through Tiff and his many outings that, that he goes there. And I, I go to Goodwood quite often for all their events and what they put on is, is quite superb. And it's lovely to see older cars, which are worth millions of pounds, being hooned around. I, honestly, I've, I have such admiration for people who just do that because for the like, you know, I, I love watching it. So it's really, you know, it's, it's a lovely thing. And, and Karun as well, of course. He, yes. Another vicarious experience yeah. for you. He, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He's a big Goodwood man as well. Yeah. So I think we've got one more question down at the back here. Hi there, Vicky. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Oh. Uh, just, are we going to see another generation of Butler Henderson's racing soon? <laughs> oh, can of worms. <laughs> um, oh, I'm chucking a tennis racket at them quite often. I have been karting with my two children, so a 13-year-old girl and a 9-year-old boy, and I did say to them last night, we went indoor karting at an electric kart track. We'd never been there before, and it was just the four of us, and I said, look, 
okay, it was my husband as well. I was like, look, if, do you want me to go around? You know, I'll show you the racing line and, you know, then we can make a bit of a thing of it. And they were like, nah. So I was like, right, right. <laughs> That's it. Helmet on. <laughs> and, and I just got, got such red mist. I was just like, I've, I've got to dominate the times. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Me zapping past a nine-year-old, honestly. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was quite bad. <laughs> But they do, they enjoy, they love going sideways if I'm, you know, if I'm taking them somewhere. Or, <laughs> and they, they really enjoy the whole, you know, the, the noise and the theatre of, of Lamborghinis or Ferraris. So they, they really do appreciate that. But I have spent, uh, the closest I have been to watching my child compete is, you know, probably watching my brother race. And it is the most horrific experience because when I race I'm in control I'm in the moment it's me that's it I'm not worried about anyone else but when you're observing you worry you you know it's it's draining it's really draining and I oh I, to do that with my own children but I don't know how my mum and dad did it with both my my brother and I mm -hmm. But my, my mum always came to races, but she would always sit in the van and not watch, or, and I understand how she feels. But it, half of me would love to say, yes, let's keep the tradition going, but the scaredy-cat maternal instinct for me says no. Mm -hmm. <gasps> what should I do? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your question. Yeah, very good questions this evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Big hand for Vicky Butler Henderson. Oh, thank you. Thank you.